So we now have a, a shift of subject and we also have a double act coming up. We have Dr. Catherine Anena from Macquarie University and Dr. Solva Ibrahim from the Centre for Development Studies in Cambridge who are doing a joint project. Um, Catherine's involved in gender-based violence and economic empowerment and uh, Solva on poverty dynamics and intergenerational transmission. And it's going to be an interaction with those two. And I think Solva's going to start. Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And this is my third uh, Cambridge Africa Day, but it's my first time to actually uh, present and be a more active participant. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, be here uh, in collaboration with Dr. Anena um, on a project we've been working on on gender-based violence. And I would end with the what uh, our uh, very uh, interesting law speaker said that women do not lack the ability or the trying. So we're bringing you back to um, a bit on uh, voices of women in Uganda. And uh, just a bit on myself, I'm um, uh, originally from Egypt and my former PhD supervisor, Dr. Charlotte de Fennell and I, 14 years ago, applied to a conference in South Africa, uh, writing a paper in Africa, and got back a reply, Egypt is not in Africa. I was like, it was last time I checked. So I feel extremely honored to be part of this program, not only to reassert my African identity, but because it gives me a great pleasure to, um, to show how much either we're from North Africa or from Sub-Saharan Africa or Southern Africa, we seem to um, uh, uh, work or, well, suffer from the same problems as women, but also uh, work on uh, very similar topics. So my, my work focuses mainly on another type of gender-based violence other than the one we're gonna talk about today. So I focus more on, on female genital mutilation uh, in Egypt and Senegal. Um, and just to start to tell you a bit on the motivations for our study, I'm sure most of you were aware or got caught in the news about the Me Too campaign and all the women who got empowered and started reporting about sexual harassment, which is another form of uh, GBV. Uh, however, what we're going to talk about today are experiences of women who might not be able to go on Twitter or have a campaign to actually talk about their experiences of gender-based violence uh, because their experiences are highly rooted and embedded in gender-based inequalities and unequal power relations, uh, not just at work, but also primarily in the household. So. Um, and the impacts of GBV are not only on the women themselves, but they actually impact on society as a whole, and even if you're, there are any economists in the room, on economic productivity as well. So our motivations for this study is if we look at this graph, I'm, sh I'm sorry if, if the numbers are, uh, if the names are too small, but just to show that if you look at the, the, um, uh, the prevalence of uh, gender-based violence, uh, African countries quite very much top that list, sadly so. Uh, so one of the motivations was to look at recent data on gender-based violence and to, according to World um, Health Organization, over 35% of women suffer from gender-based violence of different forms. Um, in, in India, it's much higher, but as I already mentioned, there are different forms of gender-based violence. It could be sexual harassment, it could be female genital mutilation, and what we are going to focus on today is gender-based violence within the household, by, particularly by male partners. In order not to intimidate any uh, men in the room, we are aware that gender-based violence could be directed towards men, but our primary focus has been uh, on women. Now, the way we define gender-based violence is uh, an, an umbrella term to cover a harmful act or even the threat of harmful uh, uh, act to, um, uh, between males and females. 
Now, why are we choosing Uganda? Not only because of uh, uh, my collaborator, who's based in, in Makerere University, but also because gender-based violence is quite one of the biggest problems uh, in Uganda. Either it's in the form of rape, or uh, as this um, statistic from the uh, Demographic and Health Survey shows, uh, approximately 60% of married women experience either emotional, physical, or sexual forms of violence from their partners. And the last bit of information on this slide is the most interesting one, is that less than 2% of them actually seek help. So that shows the kind of stigma surrounding gender-based violence. So our research problem was really to try and look at how do NGOs try to address this problem? Mostly, they see economic empowerment as the you know, the magic bullet. Give women, give those women who are victims of GBV some money, empower them economically, and then they're going to leave those abusive relationships. However, the research on that has been quite mixed. So on the one hand, it is true that empowering women economically can help them to support themselves and to leave those abusive relationships. However, there is another research or another body of research that shows that in some instincts in some instances it can even increase women's vulnerability to gender-based violence this is when the women are empowered economically they start to challenge the male's uh, male domination in the household and hence then gbv is used as a way to contain these women and hence their vulnerability to gbv is uh, much higher. So our main research question was really, okay, what are the factors that then affect the relationship between women's vulnerability to gender-based violence and their ability to be economically empowered? And our main argument is really that economic empowerment is important, but is not sufficient to empower women to uh, either leave those abusive relationships or decrease their vulnerability to gender-based violence. And there are other important factors that play a role in enhancing or decreasing this vulnerability, such uh, as, for example, the existing social norms, the existing patriarchal relations in the household, the existence of family, uh, of family and interpersonal support. In many cases, families, as my collaborator will show, Families actually force the women to go back to those abusive relationships, um, as well as the psychological damage that GBV causes um, to those women and the existence or absence of institutional and legal support. So what we tried to do in our project is to compare the experiences of gender-based violence between women from different income groups, um, and we interviewed them in uh, focus groups and individual interviews, and discuss the ways in which those contextual factors play a role in their decisions to remain or uh, leave those abusive relationships. So, well, I'm not gonna bore you with theory, but just for um, the social scientists in the room and maybe others as well, we look at GBV as a form of unfreedom. What does that mean? It means that GBV as um, as a form of violence does not only affect women in terms of uh, physical harm, but it does damage their sense of agency uh, as well as their ability to pursue other forms of uh, uh, other capabilities and choices that they might have in life. So we look at GBV as a disempowering uh, process. And more importantly, we look at gender-based violence uh, and as empowerment, as highly contextual. Um, just a small anecdote, because the World Bank was so much praised in the last presentation. Um, I was presenting on female genital mutilation to a World Bank audience before, and then when, I, when, when they said, when I talked about female genital mutilation, their first question was, okay, how many women stopped it? But it's not about stopping the practice, it's about even talking about it. That is empowering in this particular context. So in that sense, we look at GBV as very contextual and the empowerment process as being very much so uh, empowering, uh, sorry, contextual and, and dependent on how women themselves perceive this uh, empowerment process. So without further ado, I'll hand over to my collaborator to share with you our research findings.
Hi, everyone. Um, Dr. Catherine Anena from Makere University. I was um, sharing with a few friends and saying, yeah, I'm going to fly our flag a little higher today uh, out there in Cambridge. And I'm so happy that my dean is present here today. Um, I teach with uh, the School of Women and Gender Studies. And I also do a lot of consultancies, particularly surrounding gender-based violence. And um, in those consultancies, in the discussions with the, with the women particularly, um, a lot of uh, factors actually uh, came up that showed that perhaps the increasing focus on empowering women economically might actually be insufficient and could actually be worsening the situation for many women um, in Africa. And so that, to some extent, also contributed and motivated our choice of topic, like my colleague um, has said. And so the question then that we would like to answer today is, does women's economic empowerment reduce vulnerability to GBV? Well, our findings are actually quite interesting. If you look at that chart from the discussions that we had with uh, women, from the interviews that we had with women, we compared economically independent women, defined as women whose uh, income levels were above uh, 300,000, that's about 60 pounds in, 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 um, if, if you do the, conver uh, the conversion. And with discussions with uh, focus, group, uh, focus groups in, in Ginger, we zeroed in on the, the figure 300 pounds as the bare minimum with which somebody is able to survive and support their families. Now, we spoke to women in the category that earns more than 300,000, as well as women who do not earn more than uh, about 300,000. And the category that earns 300,000 and above were the women we felt, well, uh, we could categorize as economically independent in the sense that they're able to provide uh, for themselves and to support themselves if they so wished uh, to do so. And then the economically dependent women, those that had to rely on outside support in order to supplement their income. Um, and we found that all these categories of women, whether economically independent or economically dependent, experienced more or less the same forms of gender-based violence. If you look at this chart, economic abuse, physical assault, uh, or physical abuse, psychological abuse, all categories of women, both in the independent category as well as in the dependent category, experienced this. Now, although there were slight differences in terms of evictions from home and uh, in terms of exposure to rape and defilement, you still see that in both cases, both economically independent women and economically dependent women uh, actually experience these forms of GBV. And that led to a realization that perhaps it's really not about money. It's not money that determines one's vulnerability to GBV. Discussions with economically independent women actually revealed that in some instances, the fact that they had income of their own actually triggered violence from their spouses. In some cases, the spouses felt threatened because of that economic uh, advantage that the women had over their spouses, and therefore tried to reassert their authority in the home using violence. And so in such cases, having money actually worsened the situation of some of these women. Now, that particular realization 
brought us then to question what other factors might be coming into play to push women's vulnerability apart from the economic aspect. And so one of the factors that we looked at, the social cultural factors. And we zeroed in on patriarchal norms, arguing that uh, norms that encourage or that, uh, that push for women's subordination to men, obedience, subservience to men within uh, the cultural setting, uh, patriarchal norms that uh, create some kind of hierarchy, social hierarchy, placing men much higher within the social ladder compared to uh, the females within that particular community, were actually pushing some of the experiences of GBV in almost the same, um, uh, in almost the same measure as having economic power within, uh, the, uh, within the community. So we had a situation where due to fear to rock the boat, because social norms are stating that you have to abide by these regulations, you have to abide by these uh, social expectations, social stereotypes. This is what a woman should be. This is what a good woman should be. This is what a good wife should be. And part of the uh, factors that determine or distinguish a good wife from a bad wife, uh, obedience, subservience to men, um, total submissiveness in uh, the context of ginger. So many women fear to rock the boat and or challenge these traditional stereotypes or the social cultural factors. And because of that, many of them conform. They strive to conform to the social uh, expectations which in turn normalized GBV. A few weeks ago, one of our members of parliament, a man, stood in front of the cameras on national television and stated for all the world to hear that it's okay to beat your wife, a member of parliament. And in Uganda, <laughs> Uganda has actually ratified quite a number of protocols against GBV. And Uganda has put in place a number of laws, uh, acts, bills, passed so many policies that are intended to protect those that are vulnerable to GBV and hopefully to prevent the occurrence of GBV. Now, the same parliament that this gentleman belongs to passed these laws. And so the question then becomes, how could you pass such a law and come out and stand in front of people and say it's okay to beat women? And he kept repeating it and repeating it over and over again. Now, having a member of parliament speak like that sends a particular message to the community that it's okay, it's okay, you can beat your wife. You know, it helps to make her disciplined in quotes. Okay? And that's the message that actually we found very, very strongly rooted in the communities in Jinja, where in an attempt to promote obedience and subservience to men, violence was often used uh, to create the kind of discipline that was desired to uh, normalize patriarchy. Now, cultural ties and living arrangements also make it almost impossible for many of these women to fight such um, patriarchal norms as well as the exposure to GBV. For instance, in many cases in, uh, in the communities that we visited, the women were actually living in the same compound with their in-laws. Now, in cases where a woman is beaten, even if she seeks to leave the, the homestead and go and report, she would still have to come back and live with her in-laws, the relatives of the person that she has taken to court or she has reported to police. And so the question then becomes, how will she, you know, how will she fit in? Uh, what, what would be their attitude towards her, considering that she has sent their son to prison? And so for many women, that kind of fear, the kind of living arrangements promote uh, a normalization of GBV and a culture of silence around GBV. Many would prefer to keep quiet 
than rock the boat and uh, create problems or create a situation where there's a lot of stigma and uh, a lot of opposition to there being a good and acceptable wife. And so for many, it becomes very, very difficult um, to move out of that environment of uh, violence. So in such situations, therefore, you see how social cultural factors can actually have a very, very strong uh, influence in terms of exposing women uh, to GBV, the social cultural expectations, the living conditions, as well as the norms surrounding um, relationships. And then we moved on to look at the familial and interpersonal relationships. And we argued that family support, relations uh, with, with relatives and extended family are all very, very strong factors that also tend to regulate uh, vulnerability to GBV. For example, uh, the lack of de uh, dependable and protective or supportive social um, networks make or create a situation where women find it very, very difficult to leave abusive relationships, like my colleague uh, spoke earlier on. In Uganda, marriage is considered so important, much more important almost than the well-being of the woman that is married in that particular uh, union. The fear of the label divorcee is so strong that many women would rather stay in there than face society as a single mother or as a divorcee. And because society, namely the relatives, uh, sometimes actually promote or push the women to stay there, it becomes almost impossible for women to leave such abusive relationships. Social perceptions of good women as submissive, dutiful wives who surrender their full authority to the, uh, to the male partner were very common in the communities that we visited. But we also found out that the, 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 the strong mother figure, there's a very powerful role that a strong mother figure plays in regulating uh, a woman's vulnerability to GBV, much stronger uh, than, than the support from other relatives. And we discovered that in cases where a woman had a strong mother or a mother figure, it could be an aunt or a family friend, more or less like a mentor who would guide her and say, look, this is not okay. It's not fine for you to stay in an abusive relationship or somebody that they can fall back on you know, and, and, and uh, rely on for support. When it came to uh, social meetings, for example, the clan meetings, where such uh, GBV uh, cases are often uh, had at a community level, the presence of such a strong mother figure was found to be very, very instrumental in helping some women to fight uh, vulnerability to GBV and to protect themselves from vulnerability to GBV. However, the social attitudes and the social perceptions actually seem to have a very, very strong uh, role to play as well in terms of regulating vulnerability. For example, these are some of the voices that we got from our respondents. And many of the respondents argued and said they get such statements from the community which make them unwilling or afraid to move out of their relationships. For example, which man doesn't beat you? Just stay there as long as he provides. No matter how bad the violence is, you're being told, stay there, hang in there. Be brave. No matter how bad the treatment, stay for the kids and to avoid shaming the family. You can imagine that. So it's more family shame is considered more important than the woman's well-being. Are you the first woman to be beaten by a man? Go back and keep him happy before he finds solace in another woman. You can imagine that. So when you look at the voices 
uh, the, 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 the reports that these women were giving, the kinds of words that they were being told whenever they reported incidences of GBV, it shows how much the society values marriage and social relations much more than the well-being of individual women. And, and with this kind of attitude, we found that in Jinja, it, it became very, very difficult for many women to break away from the chains of such uh, abusive relationships. But we also looked at psychosocial uh, factors, low self-esteem and low self-worth. And one of the key things that we found is that women who had more self-esteem or a higher uh, level of confidence had a stronger level of agency and were more empowered to break free from the chains of abuse. And again, traditional norms, social attitudes reinforce these levels of esteem. We talked about uh, the social cultural norms a little bit earlier on. And we also talked about the stereotypes. This is what you should be as a woman. A woman should not be uh, too aggressive. A woman should be submissive. A so such attitudes and such perceptions about what a woman should be in society tend to be very, very disempowering in terms of um, eroding women's level of agency mm -hmm. by eroding their self-worth, their self-confidence, and their, their level of uh, confidence in terms of being able to move out and, and take care of themselves and leave abusive relationships. So the internalization of this feeling uh, of self-worth and low self-esteem was found to be very, very disempowering for the women that we uh, interacted with. And we found that those that had a higher level of self-esteem were more confident about moving out of abusive relationships and um, actually did so. Now, we also looked at the legal and institutional weaknesses. And we argued that much as Uganda has put in place so many policies, uh, laws that are intended to, uh, to, to protect women from gender-based violence, we still have significant uh, problems. We also have, of course, the police, uh, the Family and Child Protection Unit, which again is intended to protect women uh, and some vulnerable men from gender-based violence. We have the community development officers whose role is to sensitize communities uh, on, on gender issues, uh, to help also protect women and those, uh, against GBV cases, as well as um, to foster a better uh, community uh, relations between men and women through sensitization. And then, of course, we have several NGOs uh, with, with GBV programs. The School of Women and Gender Studies is doing a lot in terms of sensitization. However, there are challenges. Much as we have the laws, for instance, there is a lot of ticking, uh, culture of ticking the boxes so that you present to the donors and say, yes, we have a ministry of gender, but the ministry of gender is the most underfunded uh, ministry in Uganda. And then you'll say, oh, yes, we, we have all these laws on GBV, but despite the laws on GBV, there is still a persistence of harmful institutional practices, corruption, Okay? And because of that, many women find it difficult to get justice. For example, cases uh, among the women that we interviewed, there were reports that whenever they try um, to report a case to the police, they're asked for money. In cases of rape, before the doctor examines you and fills in uh, the, the, the form P3, P3 is a form that is intended for cases of rape and um, for cases of uh, other forms of gender-based violence or, or assault. And it, it basically is the doctor's, uh, uh, it requires the doctor's signature to show that yes, in this, in this particular case, uh, this person has been raped and this is the evidence. Maybe we found such uh, tears or some other evidence. Now, before the doctor puts his signature on this form, he demands for money. Now, many of these women do not have money. And so because of the demands, 
because of the harmful practices within these institutions. The laws exist, but the harmful practices make it impossible for these women to find the kind of justice that they are seeking. Within the judiciary, a few weeks ago, there was an incident in which a woman was raped on her way home, and she feared to report the incident to her husband, lest he suspect that maybe it, it was a planned uh, thing. And so she kept quiet. But the following day, the community was awash with news that, oh, so-and-so's wife was, uh, was slept with uh, uh, along the village path. And out of fear, she ran to the police and reported the case, and then came back to her husband and explained what had happened. Now, when the case eventually got to court, the lawyers on the husband's side, uh, rather on, on the perpetrator's side, alleged perpetrator's side, kept asking her so many questions, you know, and then, you know, in, in the heat of the moment, you know, the woman was so confused by all these questions, illiterate woman, you know, she was confused, she was in a, you know, in a courtroom full of strangers, everybody looking at her, and, you know, she was definitely intimidated by the whole process. And then this lawyer asks her, did you enjoy the rape? Of all questions, did you enjoy the rape? Or did you enjoy the experience? He didn't call it rape, did you enjoy the experience? And... I think out of fear or whatever the case was, the woman blurted out, yes. And the case ended there. Because according to the definition of, law, or, or, of rape, you, you, you shouldn't enjoy it, right? Because you've said no. So the case was closed. And the perpetrator walked away. Despite the overwhelming evidence, he walked away. And that's the kind of institutional kind of situation that we have. The court processes, the intimidation that uh, victims go through is so disempowering that for many people, it's better to keep quiet and suffer in silence than try to pursue a case that they feel is already not likely to go in their favor. And so most of the women that we spoke to said they would rather keep quiet. Just yesterday, there was a case reported in the newspapers. A very young lady, uh, she shares my name actually, she's called Anena Gloria. A 22-year-old uh, young girl with, with one child, uh, a one-year-old baby boy. She's lying in hospital, she's been lying in hospital for the past one week. And what happened is a drunkard was passing by her home and um, this drunkard fell in the compound, and so she decided to help him and, and take him to his home, an elderly man. And when she came back, she found her husband was already home, and he demanded to know where she was. And she said, I can take you <laughs> to, to, to prove that I only took this elderly man home, and I'm back now. And as they were moving, this man pounced on her, started beating her, so she ran back home. And when she got home, he also came in, picked a jerry can of paraffin or kerosene, and poured it on her, and set her on fire. Just like that. Now, as if that wasn't bad enough, this man was arrested, but the lady is saying she wants him out of prison because she, wants, she has forgiven him and she wants him to, to raise the child together with her. Now, speaking to the, the police officer in charge of uh, gender-based violence in Jinja, he noted that this is a very common occurrence in Jinja. Many people uh, report cases of GBV and then withdraw it. They fear to go a step further. I'm being warned my time is almost up. So when you look at the factors that affect women from breaking free, this can again be neatly summarized into the five key factors that we looked at earlier, which for, uh, for, for my collaborator and I refer to as the five key empowerment domains. The economic domain, the psychosocial domain, the familial domain, the social cultural domain, and the legal and institutional domain. And we noted that these factors are very instrumental where a woman uh, is empowered 
along all these five key domains, she is in a better position to break free from gender-based violence. Where she is disempowered, even on just one domain, the chances of her breaking free fall um, a great deal. And so in terms of uh, this particular study that we looked at, income level appears to have minimal effect in terms of mitigating exposure to GBV. Five key factors, uh, the institutional, the familial, the interpersonal, have a very, very strong interlinked uh, effect in terms of regulating GBV vulnerability. Now, these factors also have a strong influence in terms of uh, influencing women's capacity to live abusive relationships, and it's important that programs focus on these. So beyond the research, some uh, preliminary outcomes of our study. In feminist research, it's not just about providing knowledge, as we have done in this case. It's about creating transformations using the knowledge that we have uh, generated. And from this particular research, we are building um, on, 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 on the existing knowledge that we have generated to create uh, more information through further research. But we are also working with local uh, networks um, to put into practice the kinds of information that we have generated. In much of Uganda, like my collaborator said, the focus seems to be more on helping women address the economic or only the psychosocial, but not working on all the five levels of empowerment. And we are trying to change that through capacity building and through working with some of these local uh, NGOs. Uh, of course, the knowledge that we have generated would also be used to uh, influence the training and the teaching at Makerere University. But we've also uh, been able uh, to work with a few of the networks that we've uh, met here. I don't know if Theodore is here. Um, we're actually in the initial stages of developing collaboration between the DRC and Uganda following this particular study that uh, Caprex and Alborada uh, have funded, and we cannot be, we cannot overemphasize the gratitude that we have uh, for the funding that has made all this um, possible. However, some ideas in Uganda we say to serve a government to yambe, <laughs> which means literally translated it is we ask uh, our, the government or any other donors to help us. And so we are looking for further um, support uh, to enhance research dissemination within the Ugandan context uh, and of course also within the East African uh, context, which we hope will lead to capacity building for policy and program reforms. And we are hoping that Caprex and Alborada can think about um, not just focusing on helping researchers to generate knowledge, but helping to support researchers who have generated that knowledge to have an impact on the ground in terms of uh, policy and program reforms that can lead to social transformation. In Uganda, we say, Apuayo Matek, Webalenyo, Asante Sana. Thank you very much indeed, both speakers. Um, I'm afraid in the interest of time, we're probably going to have to skip questions on this session, but thank you very much indeed. That's a hugely important subject. And that was uh, fascinating and really quite disturbing information that came out.